Ready, let's go. Ready? Give me the give me the countdown, Phil. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight for Poudre School District's first session on school start times, community engagement session where we are going to have the opportunity to present you with some information, but more importantly, give you an opportunity to ask questions uh, with the experts that are here and get some of the questions you may have answered. Just a little bit about the format tonight. In addition to those of you here in our audience, we also have a PSD YouTube channel live audience in. I'm looking at them right now. I'm not too sure how many people are on there, but if they are, they're coming right through that camera there. Uh, they'll have an opportunity to keep up with what we're doing. If we have something that's going on tonight, uh, also don't forget that we archive these events and you can go to PSD's YouTube channel if you want to replay this and get some information from there. A little bit about the format tonight. Uh, I'm just going to do a couple of brief introductions for our personnel who are here and what they're going to be doing. Uh, we're also going to have a bit of a presentation to give you some information, build a little context for you, uh, and then we'll give, uh, give you the opportunity to engage in a question and answer session, and we'll try to wrap that up just a little bit before 7 o'clock. I hope that when you came in, you were prompted to take some index cards to write your questions on. That would be great. You can be writing those as you see the presentation. Uh, maybe you had something when you came in that was really important for you to get answered, but we'll start collecting those after the presentation, okay? like to uh, introduce some of our folks that are here tonight, including our board members. We have a lot of Poudre School District Board of Education members, um, so we'll just work our way across, of, find all of them. They're kind of spread out around here. We have Kathy Kipp, who's a member of the board, sitting next to Nancy Telez, a former member of our Poudre School District Board. We have Mr. Rob Pedersen, Board of Education Director. We have our board president, Christoph Fev, another board member next to him, Ms. Kristen Draper. And am I missing anyone? I get all our board members tonight. Great, great. Thanks for being here. We have some personnel here. We're going to call them experts. That makes them feel better about their information, gives them confidence as they share with you. We have Mr. Pete Hall down here. Pete's our executive director of operations. We also have Mr. Dave Montoya, executive director of finance for Poudre School District, and then sitting next to them, uh, pouring over his notes, Mr. Matt Bryan, our director of transportation. We thank them for being here. We also have Mr. Scott Nielsen, who is our assistant superintendent of secondary school. Scott's going to be handling the presentation tonight, and he volunteered to answer every single question. So that'll be great for him. Uh, we also have some other personnel that are here doing some work. We have Phil and Matt over here from Channel 10. They're going to be keeping track of the camera, audience members, different things like that. We really appreciate that. We have our communication uh, department here also with Valerie Van Ryn, Deb Hooker, Alicia Stice. Got our, we got that crew that's here. Uh, and a few others that will be coming in and out. Audience members, we just want to let you know too, after the presentation, we are going to invite you to come down here to the front because the way we'll work it out, as you have your questions after the presentation, we'll have you hand those to Ms. Lauren Hooten. You met Lauren out at the front, or actually is Val gonna do that? We're gonna have different people depending on where you are. They're gonna bring me the index cards with your questions. I'm gonna read those out. It's probably important for you to know that in addition to you hearing that, in addition to archiving it on YouTube, we'll also put the answers in print on our website, on the school start times part of the website. So we're gonna hit you with all kinds of information. We're gonna track it, we're gonna archive it, we're gonna keep it going. Like I said, before we get started here, this is the first of four engagement sessions. Uh, and we'll give you a little reminder about where the other ones are and when they take place as we go through the night. So I wanna begin then getting us started by bringing on Mr. Scott. Nielsen again Scott's our assistant superintendent of secondary schools oversees our middle schools and high schools and also uh, designed the presentation he'll get us started tonight and we'll be right back after that's over with some question and answers okay thanks for being here we really appreciate it Scott you ready I'm ready all right I think. I'm ready I'm ready I'm ready um, as Todd said thanks for coming thanks for being a part of this community engagement we appreciate it we'll appreciate the feedback the questions um, and we look forward to to working through the presentation and also Q&A this evening. As I get started, I think it's important uh, to look back. Um, about a year ago, um, staff was charged with studying the idea of Late Start and what our options are and what does research tell us. And so we've been looking at this for about a year now. Um, in all honesty, the district's been looking at it for about 10. Uh, multiple times we've looked at uh, where research is at, what, what, uh, what the community um, is looking for, 
and research over that the last 10 years has become more profound in terms of what we're looking at. And so one of the things that was landed before us a year ago was studied by the American Medical Association, which recommends start times for secondary schools uh, no earlier than 8.30. So that's their recommendation. There's other studies, if you look on our late start, um, uh, on the Poudre School District website under school start times, there's other research there as well. So if you want to go take a look at that um, in your free time, you're certainly welcome to. Um, so we, um, as we kick off tonight, want you to think about currently our secondary schools start between 725 and 815. So all of our secondary schools are earlier than the 830 recommended start time. Some of them substantially over an hour earlier than than what's recommended by the current research. Um, we also recognize as we've studied this that when you make a change as substantial as this, that it does have an impact on the community, the schools, um, right down to the individual family. So we recognize that and as we move forward, that's part of the reason we wanna make sure we get uh, information back in lots of different formats from uh, the, the early survey to the survey that's currently out there to these sessions over the next the, the month of September to see uh, what the feelings are out in the community, what are we looking for, and what are some of our wonderings as we think about the possibility of a shift like this. Um, we started this process formally with the community uh, in February. We sent out our first uh, survey to, to get a sense of where our community was at at the time. And we had uh, a good response. Our response to that initial survey was um, about three times as, as high as most of the surveys that we in Poudre School just to give out. And I think it's important to look and see 85% of the respondents um, favored some type of later start time, recognizing that, that the early start times as early as 725 um, may not be best. We also heard in that uh, um, survey that the end times were of concern as well. So that's one of the things that we uh, heard and that we want to maintain time. We want to think about the extra things students do uh, outside the school day from homework to extracurriculars to sporting events to jobs. Those are things that are happening today um, for students at the secondary level and so we want to think about how do those fit uh, in a possible configuration shift. As we uh, look, it's also important to remember that uh, I talked a little bit already about the impact it has on the family structure and thinking about dynamics in a family. Um, as a former principal, I can tell you either end um, there, are, there are challenges in that sense, so as we go through, and that's what we saw in the feedback, that we saw feedback from a later start, but also feedback from an early beginning. So you, you saw some cross um, information as we went through the, the initial surveys. The start and end times for staff should be considered, especially since meetings often take place before and after school. I think. Um, we have a chance as we look at a configuration change or start times change to think about where do meetings fit, how might that look different. Historically with, with the early start times, particularly at the secondary level, the only option for meetings was after school, outside the school day. Um, because if you're going to have a meeting that happens prior to a 725 start time, it's pretty tough. We also heard loud and clear in the initial survey that we wanted whatever we did as a district to be research-based, to, to be rooted in what is best for students. And that was um, from lots of people who even um, initially in the survey weren't super uh, excited about their elementary students changing. Also in their responses would say that comment, we'd like to do what is best for kids. So that was, um, I think, a reassuring um, finding for us to think about as we move forward let's try to do um, not just a willy-nilly shift not just make wake up one day and do something but think about what's the reason and what for those districts that have done it before and for the those that have done research on it why would this be a good fit why would it be best for students and what's some of the evidence telling us about that 
type of shift. Our second step was we created a committee um, and the committee started to meet in May. It represented all four feeder areas. We had all grade levels represented from, the, from staff perspective, so elementary teachers. Um, we had uh, middle school staff, high school staff members. We had um, some from the district office. We had parents from each of the feeder systems, and then we also had a couple um, community members at large, one who was a sleep expert, one who was from base camp, feeling like base camp um, could be a pretty, play a pretty important role in a shift or a change that we make. Uh, we know it certainly is, as our neighbor to the south is making a change right now, base camp is playing a pretty important role down there. And so that's the makeup of the committee we met. The charge of that committee um, was twofold. To consider the feedback we saw um, from survey number one, to take a look at what we were hearing, the, uh, the, 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 that feedback around um, the secondary families having a large percent that believe moving the start times back, but even the elementary families who it was about 40 percent um, were in favor of, of moving the elementary start times earlier, which as you start looking at a system, it becomes a system shift, not just, it's not as easy as just saying we're going to just pick the high schools up and plop them later. Um, we also were charged with using that information to take a look at three or four scenarios that we could take forward and uh, look a little deeper at, bring in front of the community, get feedback on, and ultimately present those scenarios with the feedback to the board as we move into the uh, November, December timeframe of this school year. As we, um, we looked at transportation obviously is a big part of a decision like this because they're the ones that move us around. So they, they were a key part of the conversations we were having. I think it's important to look at one of the, the questions we get asked a lot is who else is doing it? Um, one of the examples is, is Cherry Creek is, has, is in year two of their change. It had positive impacts. And Cherry Creek is about one-tenth the size of uh, PSD geographically so um, and have quite a few more kids than we have so it's important to think that we Matt and his team um, take kids from a 1900 square mile area uh, we run 600 runs with 128 routes that means that a bus and a bus driver can run multiple routes in a given day that allows us to be both efficient with our bus drivers and efficient with our buses, which ultimately allows us to have more dollars that we can put in the classroom for students. So, and that's a change we made eight, 10 years ago to become more efficient with our buses and our bus drivers. And I would say it's a good thing because uh, it's hard to find the number of bus drivers we need now. If we were back 10 years ago, we'd need more bus drivers and uh, would be less efficient in the process. And that provides some constraints when thinking about a change and how we move things around and how it's a big jigsaw puzzle in order to do that type of routing. When we add an additional bus, and you'll see as we talk through some scenarios, that every bus we buy is about $100,000 for the bus, and then it's $37,000 annually to run that bus. So roughly, in year number one, you buy a bus, it's $137,000, and then every year after that, it's $37,000. And so that's how we get to the numbers of what the, the particular scenario we'll walk through in a little bit would cost um, the district to run. So as we, um, we talk about that transportation piece, I already touched a little bit on the efficiency we have. Um, it is a challenge to hire and retain drivers. And that's a conversation we have a lot at the, the district office um, every year. We're, uh, we're, it's a constant cycle. Matt's constantly bringing people in, training them, and, uh, and hoping they stay for a long period of time. Uh, we did have a chance this last year to raise the amount we pay them a little. So we have this, uh, this hope, I guess, that we'll hold on to them and that we'll continue to be in a good position. 
but I will tell you as a committee member that played a, a pretty large role in some of the scenarios you start looking at if you're talking about adding um, 15, 18 bus routes or bus drivers, it's pretty hard to see um, how that would be to retain drivers, not to mention the startup cost um, that you have out the front side of, of a scenario like that. Um, and so as we sit today, Everyone that works in transportation district offices, leadership, Matt drives buses quite often, and those scenarios are not sustainable. And so that is a consideration and, and a concern we'll have any time we're talking about um, dramatically increasing the number of, of drivers, routes, buses we're looking at buying. Outside of the financial impact, um, the sustainability is a uh, issue too. If we end up with a bunch of buses we can't have, we don't have drivers for, or we're draining our people because they're trying to do the driver job and their own job, um, it just isn't a sustainable solution. So I will say that was a that played a large role in the committee's conversations. So we landed on four different scenarios that that we've brought forward. If you had a chance to look at the survey that is out and open now for you to take at any point, some of you may have taken it before you came tonight. Our hope is most of you decided you were coming tonight and they'll take it after you leave. Um, our current start time we felt like needed to be a part of it simply because that was feedback we had in our first uh, survey was there was some amount of energy saying, let's not change anything. So there was energy around that scenario. So we felt like that, that needed to be part of what we bring forward or we weren't representing the voice we were hearing. The second one we will talk about tonight is scenario A, which moves the high school to the 8.30 start time and changes one middle school and just a couple of elementaries, but the majority of the other schools stay the way they are in the current model. It, uh, scenario B that we'll talk about in just a minute um, moves the high school start time to between 8.55 and 9 o'clock with a middle school start time of 8.05 and the elementary start times between 7.45 and 8.50. And then scenario C, again we'll, we'll flush this out in just a minute, moves that high school start time back from between 9 to 9.05 moves the middle school start time to 8.35 and, and closes the gap a little for the elementary school, has them between 7.45 and 8.40. So let's dig into that a little bit. Um, we talk about the current start time. Um, obviously, the current start time doesn't meet what the research is telling us is best practice for secondary students, that 8.30 start time. Um, I think it's important to look back at the, the initial survey we took, which was um, interesting to see at all three levels, um, virtually for all subgroups, the, the awesome time to start school is between 8 and 8.30. So everybody wants elementary, middle, and high school to start between 8 and 8.30. Um, which obviously when you think about the transportation I just talked about is not a possibility. And um, I think that was an interesting finding that, that uh, is important to share. Maintaining the current system um, would have little impact on the system itself, requires no changes for family or staff. So the systems that are in place and running don't have to change. It is important as we talk about cost, as you look at the sheet that was handed out when you walked in, there's still a cost, and this will be figured into each of the scenarios. We believe we'll add three bus, buses for the, even in the current scenario, and, and run those. So it'll be a cost of the current scenario of about $411,000, with an ongoing cost of $111,000 for that addition going forward. Um, and that is figured in in any of the scenarios. We still have those three additional buses figured in. You move to scenario A, it moves our high schools to one hour later, moves them to that 8.30 start time, leaves all of our middle schools with the exception of uh, Cash Lapooter Middle School, 
which is on, shares busing with, with uh, Poudre High School because they're coming down out of the mountains for many of those bus routes. So CLP's um, middle school start time would move back, but all the rest of middle schools would stay the way they are today. Um, it does align the high school students with the 8.30 start time recommended by much of the research. So that's one of the things it does. It's the least impactful option for middles and high school students. It doesn't change much of anything. Um, the, it, it, it then the high school, as you shift their times, it moves the high school back to an end time around 4 o'clock. There might be some flexibility as we flush these out where it's around 4 o'clock, but that's what it looks like as we uh, ran the scenario is right about that 4 o'clock end time. The cost to this one would be adding six drivers, the three from the current, the same three we saw in the last slide, and three additional ones. So uh, year one cost of about $820,000 and an ongoing cost of about $220,000. So that's for scenario A. Scenario B um, moves our high school start times to 8.55 to 9 o'clock, so right around that, that 8.55 time slot, moves all of our middle schools back about 20 minutes or so to 8.05. So it moves them a little bit, doesn't get them in the same window with the AMA, but does move them back slightly. Um, it flips the elementary, so it moves many of our elementary schools earlier than they are today with elementary schools starting about 7.45. We have one today that starts at 7.45, but we end up with um, one that's today. We'd end up with um, several elementary schools starting at that 7.45 time slot in this um, scenario B. The high school end time would be roughly 4.25. Again, there's some fluctuation in there. We might be able to pull that earlier slightly but assume it's going to be 420, 425 is when the high schools um, may, uh, may end. Obviously, when you think about moving the high schools back, it changes, shifts the way we do some of the activities, um, some of our, our athletics and uh, um, game, time, game things. It, it has an impact on what happens in the afternoon. The cost for scenario B is five routes, it would be two additional routes uh, above the current scenario, and five drivers for a cost of about $685,000 with an ongoing cost of about $185,000 annually. Scenario C um, moves the high schools to about 905, so it just moves the high schools slightly back from scenario B. Um, this one allows middle schools to start one hour later than they do now. They, they all start about 8.30, 8.25, 8.30, um, and aligns both the middle school and the high school with an 8.30 start time. Um, again, it's a flipped model. It's a similar model to the scenario B, and that we've brought many of the elementary schools forward. Um, we, uh, we have nine schools in this model that start at 7.45. Um, this one moves the high school end time to about 10 minutes later, to about 4.30. And this one um, it ups the number of drivers. We end up with eight routes, eight drivers for an upfront cost of about $1.1 million. Uh, ongoing cost of almost $300,000 to do uh, that, that um, scenario ongoing. So as we went through multiple scenarios, um, we eliminated several scenarios that, uh, that were somewhere in between what, we've, what we brought forward. And most of the reason they were eliminated was the cost was too high. We had an 815 high school start time that the upfront cost was about $3 million and the ongoing cost was seven hundred fifty dollars or $800,000, something like that. Um, we had several scenarios that allowed in the flip scenario for 
elementaries to be even earlier than 745. I will say with the committee, they felt pretty strongly, keep in mind it was a cross-represented group, they felt pretty strongly that 745 was as early as we could ask elementary schools to start. And, and, and that lines up with what we have today. We have an elementary that starts at 745 today, so there was some feeling that if we've got elementary students doing it now, it's probably not, it's, it's probably safe to say elementary students could start that early. Um, we had an 845 high school start time with middle school starting 15 minutes later and elementary school starting between eight. Again, the cost of that up front was over two million it, itself. And then you can play out the ongoing was about $650,000 or something like that. So there were several that I would say were that next tier for us. And the upfront cost and ongoing cost, the committee felt like it didn't, for five or 10 minutes here or there, it didn't, it didn't provide us enough of a shift to save or to spend that much additional money. In addition to, in each of those cases, you think the, the added drivers, we've, we've gone from adding um, six or eight drivers next year to trying to add 15, 16, or 18 drivers next year which the committee again kept coming back to, we're struggling to find what we need today. And so for, to say to Matt, you need to find 18 next year. And if you think we grow three every year, 21 the following year, and, and so on and so on and so on, um, the committee felt like that put us in a pickle. So um, our next steps, this is one of them. Um, we have uh, four um, community engagement sessions each Thursday in the month of September will be at one of our comprehensive high schools. Um, we're here this week, we're at Rocky the last September, or the last Thursday in September. Next week we're at Pooter and then in two weeks we'll be at Fossil Ridge High School. The, the Pooter and Fossil Ridge are same time, 5.30 to 7. And then that last Thursday in September, the Rocky Mountain High School uh, engagement session will be uh, 6 to 7.30, one half hour back from what we've been tonight. Um, we have opened the survey. It's been out for a little over a week. Um, and it will be open for you to take the entire month of September. And we did that again feeling like there were some people, we've got several, over a thousand, I don't want to say several thousand, over 5,000 5, who have taken the survey as we speak now. So we've, we've had a lot of voice already. We're looking forward to a lot more voice as we um, have three and a half more weeks of which that survey could be taken. And then what our plan is to take it back to the board November time frame once we've been able to sort through all the feedback from our engagement sessions and our surveys. We'll present to the board asking the board to, to make a decision. Um, our hope is in December and uh, for us the earlier the better. So we have, if there is a change, um, we have as much time as we can to communicate with, uh, with our families. At that point, I'm going to say we're moving to, sh to part two, where I would ask, I see several that are up in the upper sections, if we could get everyone to move down, it would be a little more uh, quaint for our Q&A. Um, we're going to bring a panel up that can answer questions. Um, although Todd did say he's going to answer all of them tonight. So I think we may have a panel, but Todd will take them all. Thanks, Scott. We do have a change of plans. Parents, you look really comfortable where you are. At least Mark got up and moved there. Parents, you stay right where you are. It's, we've been told by our collectors of questions that they don't mind running around and taking those. They could use the steps. So uh, we're good with that, and we'll go ahead. I just want to uh, remind you we've had a few uh, members join our audience once again. My name is Todd Lambert. I'm the assistant superintendent of elementary oh. schools for Pooter School District and our esteemed panel is starting to walk up here right now. Again, for those of you that came in just a little bit after things started in introductions, we, yeah, you already have heard from Mr. Scott Nielsen, our assistant superintendent of secondary schools, Matt Bryant, director of transportation, Pete Hall, executive director of operations, and sitting to his right is Dave Montoya, who's our executive director of finance. So the way we're gonna roll tonight is you write questions on index cards, both Val and Lauren will come around to grab those. I got to tell you, I've been a teacher, but it's been a little while, so penmanship would be great tonight so I could read it. it when in doubt, you might want to print. Uh, if I can't read it, it's going to be pretty tough. I'll try to avoid the redundant questions. I'll try to direct them to the appropriate personnel, 
And then I did tell this group if there were a few in there, uh, I'd try to answer them as well. I also, the first time, didn't get a chance to thank Mr. Mark Eversall. Mark's the principal at Fort Collins High School. He's sitting right down here in the front row of the upper section. Mark, thanks for hosting tonight. We really appreciate that. And all your people that helped us get this going. Just great time. All right, we will uh, get ready with some cards. I know they're going around. I'll take the first couple of questions and send these out. Uh, once again, a reminder, we're live on YouTube. Phil Primo is up there. He's running all the controls and checking with the audience. All right, first question, um, and this will be a question. I'll, I'll turn this one, Scott, to you. Uh, first question, when will high school athletic teams practice? And I think we're going to have a theme of some athletics, so I might stay on that theme for a little bit as they come in. But first question has to do with when they will practice. You want to take that one? So uh, first of all, I would say it depends a little bit on, uh, on uh, which of those scenarios we choose. Um, high school athletics, there's a chance that some of them could practice before. We have some currently that practice before. That'll be a decision we have to, to study based on uh, um, what decisions made. Uh, otherwise, what we've seen in other districts is they move practices back. They have practices in the evening. The, the outcome of the practices uh, likely means our buildings are used less by um, our community uh, uh, groups because our, our facilities end up being used a little later by us. But it's likely that we would have some opportunity to move some of what's happening outside the school day in the afternoon to beforehand, uh, particularly if you think about those two later scenarios where you're not starting till 9 o'clock, you could have a chance to do some uh, work in the morning. We already have, as I talked about, swimming that meets and does a lot of their work in the morning. Ice hockey, they do their practices when they get the uh, um, ice time. In our, uh, one of our districts, we've done some work with Cherry Creek. Those happen to be the only two sports they allowed to go in the morning. Everything else they require to, to stay in the afternoon so they could honor um, that, uh, that sleep time in the morning. That's something we'll have to study. If we end up at the 9 o'clock start time, it's a bit later than Cherry Creek went. So we've got to recognize um, what afternoon challenges we might have if, we, if we're not able to start any of our practices until after that 425 or 430 start time. Thanks for that, Scott. I'm going to push on with another question about athletics, and this might be one for Pete. Pete, there's a question about if practices go into the evening a little bit later, assuming high schools start later, that's going to push practices. We know the sun goes down in Colorado a little bit after four at certain parts of the year. Is there any plan or any ideas regarding lights installed to help with that potential issue? At, at this time, we have uh, three fields that uh, have lights. We have the varsity field at uh, uh, Poudre High School, varsity baseball field. Uh, we have the uh, French field um, over at Rocky Mountain High School, and then we have uh, Fossil Ridges Stadium. And then we also have two lighted tennis courts uh, that we co-opted with the city of Fort Collins back in 2004. So I, I think it's a great question as we look at that. Uh, we don't have any plans to add any lights to the fields at this point in time. Um, but I think as the, to Scott's point of pushing practices back, uh, have to take a look at that. Uh, we have one other synthetic field that could possibly be used in that case, which is at Kennard. So I think it's a great point for us to take a look at as we refine our scenarios. I think one of the things that, that lands in the three scenarios that are changes that's different than some other districts have done is in other districts, they have looked at high schools being in the middle and middle schools at the end. Um, as I think about the athletics at the secondary level, the middle school athletics can stay fairly close to as is in each of those scenarios, which helps a bit when you think about none of our middle school fields uh, have lights, and so that's, it's really football and tennis when you start thinking about lights in the fall, and uh, so having middle school that doesn't have to change much, um, game times in fact can stay almost exactly where they are, and if they had to move back a little bit early, then you might have to move them closer to the end of the school day as they get late in October, um, but the middle school sports, that sports season's over by the time the, the daylight savings changes, so that helps their um, high school football uh, going into November um, will require us to have some mitigation thoughts. But I think one of the things to think about is that you don't have to stay necessarily consistent through that whole season. If that's where you land, 
there are ways to mitigate um, the timing where you land, but a decision helps us make so really dig into what the specifics would be. Scott, I want to stay one more question on athletics, and then we're going to go to a couple other themes. One of the questions that came from the audience is if the day is pushed back again, we already have our students, uh, particularly our varsity athletes, are on the road. They go to Denver quite a bit. Pushing it back means that they may need to uh, they get an earlier start and potentially miss classes in the afternoon. Has there been any, any thought uh, what the impact might be on our, on our, on our, on our athletes as they uh, potentially could be missing classes to get a head start on 25 or heading south to travel? Yeah, I would say we, we think about, I mean, I think about that a lot. I mean, I think about that a lot today because we have kids missing classes at the middle school and at the high school right now for athletics. Um, we, I would answer that question in two ways. We actually think there's a chance that we may miss less class at the middle school level just by the nature of the order of busing and how we would do busing. Right now our middle school athletes are dropped off by, by transportation um, between 45 minutes and an hour before the game time, which happens to coincide in many of our sites with when they end school. That means they were out of school a half hour or 40 minutes before the end of school at the school they were leaving. The high schools, um, what we've heard from districts that have made the transition is there, there is some play in, 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 in your, particularly with your league, in having them start game times a little bit later. Now in Cherry Creek that worked easier because their transportation, their needs and where they're going isn't necessarily as far um, of a bus ride as some of the places that we go from Poudre. So there's, it, it's going to be hard to say that we'd make the transition to any of those and we wouldn't likely have an equal amount of educational time missed, maybe even slightly more. That's hard to know until we actually get into and see how flexible the other sites and the chassis events would be with, uh, with timing for those travel events. Again, when, we, when we've talked to Cherry Creek, uh, they have seen some flexibility with teams they've played against, and other schools were not flexible with the time of starting those events. And so that does dictate when you leave. There are other sporting events right now where um, students are out all day. I like I think about golf, a golf match. They miss pretty much the entire day of school as we speak. So something like that isn't going to change given any of those four scenarios. I'm going to shift out of sports for just a moment. There's a question regarding, uh, this is for an elementary. With the earlier elementary start times, any idea on the numbers of students in after school base camp for a longer period of time um, as well as the number of students that could potentially be sent home earlier and be home alone. I'll take that question. How about I give you guys a breather for a second. Um, the, the question regarding number of students that are going to be in base camp, we won't know what our parents' options are, what they'll opt to do uh, until we actually settle on a scenario. I will tell you that um, it would start with the elementary day starting sooner. We would initiate and, and, and move the base camp operations up a little sooner. Let's assume that uh, we have 45 minutes or so of an earlier start time, logically it would correspond at the end of the day. Um, how parents feel about that will probably be up to them. Those will be personal choices at home. I will tell you that base camp uh, wraps kids up right around six o'clock. I don't see that changing any, but yes, if the start time changed and parents had their families participating in base camp, they could conceivably be there for a little bit longer on the afternoon side. Uh, I think we'd have to look at the beginning of day when they get the students in. It doesn't look like that'll be impacted a great deal, but the end of the day could potentially have students there just a little bit longer. Dave, we had a couple of questions about money. And okay. uh, first one had to do with, uh, well, I'll just sum up three questions. If we're going to go into spending more money on buses, more money on drivers and all that, and we already have an existing budget, that's going to be new money in the budget. Where's that coming from? Yeah, and I think it depends on how quickly we're implementing something like that. But um, there's a couple of things that, that I, I was thinking about as I looked at the presentation and listened to, to the... Um, Mr. Nielsen, uh, one is that there's a, it looks like there's a need for some one-time dollars in there or capital needs. And um, and I know that working on the existing budget, uh, that was one of the things that was contemplated as we talked about the board's reserve this year and setting the budget was possibly utilizing or increasing that reserve to help support 
school start times if necessary. So, so that is a, a source for one-time money if we needed it. Um, I think there's other options to get at capital dollars too as we, as we look at the budget. Um, I would also say that um, uh, you know, the upcoming bond issue will, will have a big impact on, on what we're doing with capital across the district and, and that will help too. Um, as I look at the ongoing costs though, I, I think that, um, yes, I see the costs there and I, I do see that they are they're enough that we need to take notice of. Um, I don't see anything that with a little bit of planning couldn't be done through the budget process in preparation for a, a subsequent budget year or even, you know, if it was moving quicker, uh, a, a mid-year adjustment. But, um, but those, uh, those numbers are manageable, I think, with some strategic planning. Scott, I'm going to turn this one to you. This, ha this is a question regarding what we have learned from some of our other districts. There's a particular reference to Cherry Creek, and if they learned anything regarding uh, feedback from their students, their families, maybe even some statistics as far as performance, um, that's one part of that. And then kind of a follow-up to that that's part of it. Um, have we learned or had any conversations with other districts and learned from any mistakes they may have made? What did they fail to plan for so that we can uh, not make that same mistake? Well, I'll start with Cherry Creek, and I think it's a little early to know uh, the academic outcomes. Um, I think as, as we've looked at and, and had a chance to see, Cherry Creek is pretty... Uh, they're pretty open about what's going on down there. They have been in the process on the front side of their transition. I think they're looking and saying, hey, the more districts that make the move, the easier it will be for them. And, and there's, that, that, there's some truth to that, just as you talk academics or athletics. Um, but they had a presentation uh, this summer where they talked about the social emotional impacts that they saw for their high school students. And for me, looking at that, it was pretty profound where they were seeing impacts in the drop in anxiety for students. They were seeing um, students self-reporting. They felt more ready for school when they got to school. They, they did a study. They did a, a study with one of the, the hospitals down there. So they had some pre and post data, which was, is pretty neat. Um, one of the things we hear a lot is, well, if kids go to school later, they're just going to stay up later. Well, in fact, what Cherry Creek found was that was true. They stayed up an average of about eight minutes later, and they slept about 50 minutes longer. So that was an extra 42 minutes of sleep that the students were getting during the week. They also found, again reported by the students, that they didn't need the catch-up sleep on the weekend that we often hear about. You often hear that middle school, um, high school student that they sleep until 10, 30, 11, maybe even as late as noon on the weekends so they can catch themselves up. The Cherry Creek found that, was, that dropped. They didn't need that. They were more consistent in their sleep all week long. So, um, and there's, there's lots of that other, I can't rattle off all the data they had, but the, every social emotional data point they had um, showed a positive increase in year one. And that, so that was pretty profound for me. That's what the research talks about. It talks about um, safer driving, um, feeling like they're more prepared, feeling like they're able to engage academically from the start of school rather than if you've taught, and for me as a secondary teacher and principal, when you watch those students for like the first 60 minutes of class, teachers often say that's a great class because they're, they're, they step in and they're not super alive. But that's not really a great way to learn. Um, and that's what Cherry Creek saw. In terms of things that we have looked at or are studying, one of the ones I think we're learning a bit from right now is, again, our neighbor to the south, um, who they went into this quickly. And one of the things I appreciate right now is that we were charged with doing this and that, that our board said, take some time and study this. There's, there's energy in this community, has been energy in this community to do a change like this for a long time. But they said, let's take a look at it, let's study it, let's get community um, voice, both here and through surveys, as best we can. Um, Thompson, our, our district to the south, they, they went, they believed it was a good change. Their administration, their board felt like it was a good change. And they went. And that's hard. Um, when you go fast into a change like this, that can be a challenge, and that's how this year started for, for them with some challenges. You saw some articles in the paper 
about uh, some of the challenges. They're still trying to mitigate as we speak. I would hope as we um, go down this, if we end up making a change, that most of our mitigation will be prior to the end of this school year, not starting next school year in terms of planning and understanding um, what some of the challenges and opportunities will be for us as we step into it. I also would say um, Greeley made some changes in how they um, looked at things. They made some changes in busing and, and walking distances and that lasted for them about a year, Matt, and I think they've gone back and recognized that transition of shifting particularly the amount of busing that they provided for their high school students uh, didn't pan out the way they thought it might and so now they're they're back providing a little bit more transportation for high school students there's a couple of examples I think of, of things we've learned but really I think it comes back to wanting voice wanting to understand what research is telling us and then if in fact there's a change wanting to have time to make the change and do it well Thank you. I'm going to go down with uh, Matt, Pete, and Dave. They look like they would like to answer some questions, if you ask me. So one of the ones that came up, <laughs> still on the financial end, mm. away from what we may or may not have learned from some of our peers across the state that have done this, any costs outside of transportation? We've talked about bus drivers. We've talked about buses. What might mm. be some uh, associated, costs with the, associated costs with this as we've dug in and studied the work? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I'll start off, but I think there's some others that we were just talking earlier about some of those operational costs. Um, you know, we look at uh, do, and we haven't looked this level yet, but um, but we look at uh, do we need to change custodial times? Is there is there times for um, support staff that'll need to shift because of the the changing hours? Is there um, all those other support items? And and I don't know if there's others that would add, but I think that I think that's some of the main thrust of what I think about. One of the others that we're paying close attention to is the new three-tiered rate for the city of Fort Collins. And as we shift into the afternoons a little bit more, when they have those, what used to be known as the coincident peak, if you will, now it's just the, uh, for the usage of families, whether they were still in school, uh, and wasn't all that long ago, we would shut systems down to try to manage the coincident peak because of the cost rate that it would impact the district with. So now, with families and impact time shifting a little later, we're probably not going to have that opportunity, so that cost would be extended from utility standpoint, undetermined at this point in time, but especially perhaps in the cooling season. So something we're paying attention to. So let's step away from our costs for a minute. Are there going to be any costs that are going to be on uh, the backs of our families with this kind of change? So one of the questions that came up was, because of the changes, do we anticipate any differences in any of the costs or anything associated with family, family work, family budgets. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an extremely hard question to answer based on each family's given situation. Um, I would anticipate that changing, uh, I'm just thinking from my perspective as a parent and how that might impact my budget. Um, you know, depending on my situation, am I, am I driving my, my student to a choice school, am I not? Um, what, is, what is the situation for uh, maybe for, uh, my kids that may be having to watch siblings as they come home, those are costs that I think are very hard to quantify um, and to even put um, here, but I think they're ones that we would have to recognize that um, each family is going to have their unique circumstances and they're going to they're convert that into what they consider a, an equity cost, if you will. Okay, one of the questions... Putting in a finance term. Thanks, Dave. I know that was a tough question. It's hard to, hard to pick that one, but I think we want to try to answer the ones that are here. Also, just a reminder, both uh, Val and Lauren are around. If you have additional questions, I'll, I'll put this one out there. One of the questions was, can we weigh in on the end times for individual schools? And they were making, uh, using the example of a 223, 228 kind of dismissal time is all full early in the day for the elementary students. So the question really is though, can they weigh in on those particular aspects? The survey is open. Lauren, I believe we have an opportunity for open-ended on that. So you can absolutely pinpoint the type of feedback you'd like to give and speak directly through the survey. Uh, that not only counts on what scenarios you like, but any of the other aspects associated with it. Scott, I'm going to come back to you. One of the highlights that we have for many of our high schools is a late start Wednesday. 
High schoolers start about an hour or so later than normal. We run the buses. Are there plans to do anything with that? Will that still hold true? Will we continue late start Wednesday, or is that going to go by the wayside? The decision has not been made at this point, but I would say it's unlikely that we would have a later late start. Um, we'd already be a late start every day in any of those three scenarios, so it's unlikely that we would have um, something that started later than any of those three start times. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the questions had to do with the 17% was initial survey participation. What is the actual number of respondents? And I'm not sure if we're, Lauren's gonna answer that one. Okay, uh, one of the questions, and this could just be a free-for-all for anyone as you've been members of the committee, one of the questions was, do we have any particular subgroups or, or groups in our community that might be more adversely impacted by this potential change than others? And did we consider any of that as we looked at times and made some of our decisions in creating scenarios? I think there's, uh, and I'll answer it this way, I think, that any time you move from what you know to what's different, um, you have a chance. I think about the question earlier around um, athletics that might happen early in the morning. Does that impact families differently than, than athletics after school? And transportation-wise, it doesn't really change. We, don't, we offer transi uh, transportation to school and home. So we'll get you there, and then you're there for athletics but then we don't have transportation to get home. If we moved athletics in the morning, we wouldn't have transportation to athletics, but then we'd be able to get you home. So does that have an adverse effect on a different subset of, we don't know that yet. That's, a, 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 I think, something we'd have to dig into as we know more and as we start to look at, once we know where we're going, the zero hour concept. Um, how would that adversely affect access and opportunity, which is one of the conversations I think that is in our, our heads a lot is um, do, what's access and opportunity look like for all students as we work toward educating all of them? We've had some conversations up here about after school practices and sports that are sanctioned by the school. What uh, one of the questions has to do with, in addition to that, have we heard from our community, particularly about jobs for teenagers, tutoring centers, uh, sports classes, and activities like dance and karate, maybe not associated with the school per se or sanctioned by the school, but nonetheless at a time and extracurricular. Have we had anything, has you gone through the feedback, any indications or any thoughts about that? Yes, there certainly was concern in the first survey um, from some that moving end times back in the day could adversely affect the options for kids to do other things outside the school day. Um, working, if your job that you're able to work at now starts at four um, and your, your day goes to 4.30, that job, that option would be um, shifted. But we've also heard from some independent employers that they're looking to work with those individual students and so they would still have to, to work and try to figure out what hours would, would work. I think one of the other things I might add in this question that we heard um, relatively often in the first survey was this idea of um, family time. So outside of the extra things they do, there were lots of families who responded that were concerned about just dinner time and how do we have and how does this impact um, things like dinner time and, and the time we have as a family unit in the evening and, and, and how much does this shift impact that and, uh, and or potentially move it back. So th those are a couple that we heard um, in the first survey. One of the questions too, and, and, I'll, and I know there's a lot of questions about extracurricular and, ath and athletics, just a, a simple statistic. What percentage of PSD students are athletes and is, a, is that a large enough student population to dictate our schedules? Oof, I should know that off the top of my head, and it's, Lauren, do you, yeah, 35. So 
it's a big chunk. I think it is important just in, in thinking about a change, though. If, if, in fact, you make the change, you're making the change for everybody. Um, and so, and, and then you have to figure out for the percentages, where do, they, where do they fit? Right now, the early start time is for everybody. So depending on where the, the decision's made, I think that is an important um, factor for the board to consider is, is it is a big chunk that do extracurriculars. I will say over the last couple of years, our high schools have moved closer to uh, single lunches. And one of the things that has had a, a good impact on is it's brought um, many of our clubs and extracurricular opportunities inside the school day. Because as you go back to the access and opportunity conversation, with no bus ride home, anything you do outside the school day is harder for um, all students to access. And so we've got lots and lots of clubs and activities that happen during that lunch time at our high schools, um, which could continue uh, if the change is made. And I think that's a, that's a positive change that's been made outside of this shift, but I think helps without having everything happen outside the school day, which when you have multiple different lunches, many of your clubs have to happen outside the school day because they can't meet the needs of all students during the day. Another question about base camp. Base camp, as you know, is our before and after school provider. It's a valued partner for Poudre School District. And the question was, they had heard mention of base camp here just a few moments ago coming from me. Is that program advocating for a certain schedule? Not necessarily, but I will tell you that Seth Kelly, who is the base camp director, uh, executive director for base camp was on the committee so Seth was there able to hear everything and as uh, scenarios were formed and times were created and we looked at some of the options Seth was fully in the loop on that I think Seth's attitude is uh, we're always going to continue to be a great partner with Poudre School District and as soon as we learn exactly what the times are we'll start working according to that and communicate with our families as you know base camp is not only in Poudre School District it's also in Thompson School District they're a little smaller scale there but Seth is getting a front row seat into what that change looks like this year uh, but he's paying close attention. But again, he was on the committee. Also want to recognize as we introduced our board members, Mr. Nate Donovan came in. He's sitting right back there paying close attention to what's going on. I'm going to move to a different question. Pete, this one's going to be for you. Uh, do these plans consider the new schools being built in the next few years, in the next few years, and how so? I think with the, uh, uh, as Dave mentioned earlier, with the financing, uh, as we're looking out from growth, uh, some of the staffing units were being uh, uh, considered at a point in time as what that would look like as we begin to hire. That's out there a ways, but uh, that was taken into consideration. The other is, and Matt could probably speak better this, uh, to this than I could, but I know as far as the routes, trying to develop is um, the feeder systems now will change a little bit uh, from the east side of I-25 and the north side now with the Wellington area. So in some ways it may shorten some bus routes up on the north side and, uh, and the east side uh, develop some north south routes along I-25 or County Road 5. So yeah, we're taking a look at that at this point in time and, and I think the committee weighed that into some of their decisions, but this was the work now is to precede that. Thank you. Anybody else have anything they want to add on that one before I shift? Great question coming up here, and this could be for anyone to take. Might be Scott's. Has anyone asked the students what they think? And if so, what did they say? Now the students were in favor of, uh, the students we asked were at the high school level. Um, we didn't ask our elementary students. And in the first survey, we didn't ask our middle school students. Um, our high school students were in favor. A large percentage of them were in favor of a later start. They're not super excited about a later end time. Um, so they'd love to go later and, and, and be done earlier. Um, I will tell you, in, in, in the Cherry Creek data, um, their outcomes were, were pretty positive for the high school staff. The high school staff, um, I'm mean, sorry, it was pretty positive for the elementary staff that they moved their day earlier. So they go to work earlier, they get done earlier. Um, our high, the high school staff, it's an adjustment for because they come to work and, and stay a little bit later um, than their current day. The students down in Cherry Creek, uh, the high school students um, are, were very favorable after their first year of a later start. They were super excited. 
the elementary and middle responses were positive, but not as positive as the high school students down there. But yes, up here, um, our high school students were in favor of moving the start times back. So we have asked them, and we, it's open to them right now, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, right, Lauren? So. Okay, we're going to give you a chance just as you process all this. I know it's about a little bit after 6.30. We have run out of themes and questions so far. If you want to regroup, I'll give you another couple of minutes. If not, I'll just pass on some information regarding the next three engagement sessions. We'll get that slide up on the screen, letting you know where those are going to be. I believe next week is Thursday is Poudre High School, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, for those that want to continue to follow this, we'll stay live on YouTube the entire time. Once again, just a quick reminder, all the questions that are asked, we will go ahead and get those out on our website on our school start times information page. We can direct you to that. That's really good. It's keeping up with everything. We'll be able to connect you to the YouTube thing from tonight. And also, uh, as questions come in, we'll continue to process those and we'll refine those down over the next three weeks. So once again, I'll go about another minute or so. If we have any questions, I'll step out of the light. You guys went pretty easy on these four gentlemen up here, I thought. But uh, if you have any other additional ones, we'll be glad to take them. And if not, we're going to bring this to a close tonight. Uh, yeah. Uh, plan was to ask questions, Open Mark. I appreciate that. Why don't you write your comment down on a card, and I'll read it for you. Can I ask a question? Ask a question. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I think I, I can take that. I can, I can tell you, Mark, when we, when we did our uh, initial committee work, we definitely had teachers, including a representative from Fossil, as you well know, that was on that committee. We definitely looked and considered some of that, and that we think that's part of the feedback as our board continues to try to answer questions and make their decisions. But yeah, we looked at not only practice impacting our students, uh, extracurricular impact, but also the adults that supervise those and give their valuable time to take care of them. Um, again, I, I would say probably each person's circumstance is a little bit different, and we do expect with the change in time, if that's the way we go, we're going to see some family adjustments, both in those that support our students and our kids, as well as families that are going to be impacted by it, no doubt. I, I don't think we believe that that's going to go off without a hitch, or there's not going to be any adjustments for our coaches and their families as well. I don't have an answer for you to tell you what we would do about that. I think that's probably going to force, uh, like any schedule would, no matter what it is, it's going to force our coaches into making decisions about their families. And, and those are always big decisions you make with you know, spouse and kids and everything else. I think one of the things I would say is we, we, we hear that concern a lot. I have it myself. Um, that's a question I posed to the AD in Cherry Creek to find out what did they see in year one. And some of that was reality. Um, and they also saw, particularly at the high school level, um, that they were able to pull other people who aren't able to coach because our practice schedules don't work into the day of other types of jobs, that they were surprised by it was sort of a give and take. Some had to step out. Um, I do think the rigidity that Cherry Creek went of saying nothing can happen before school also impacts what happens outside the, at the end of the day. If, you're, if there's some flexibility about what you can do before and after, you have the ability to meet more needs than you do if you're completely rigid in the decision that you make. So, but, but there's no question it will have an impact. Have one more question. The, uh, this probably could be for uh, any of you up here, but Scott might be yours. The data from Cherry Creek is mentioned and referenced throughout. Is this data posted anywhere we can view? And what about other schools that have gone through this change outside of Colorado? So yes, we can put together uh, something where we can see what Cherry Creek, I, I don't know that I've seen their slides posted anywhere. I've heard about it. 
We'll see what we can do to get the information they have, their results more public. Um, they've been the most public with their outcomes of any of the schools that we've looked at. Uh, most of the Colorado schools are relatively recent, and much of the other uh, research we've seen are in the form of other people's research, not necessarily the specific schools. So there's some posts on our website currently, and we'll do what we can do to figure out how to get the results that we know about from Cherry Creek posted. I appreciate that. I believe that's going to be our last question of the night, unless anybody's going to run one up here, and then everybody's going to know it was your question. No more? All right, very good. Brave move, Mark. Thanks. Appreciate that comment very much. And thanks for the coaches for what they do. It's meant a lot for no a lot question. of the kids that you know, are a part of the families here. Again, next Thursday night, we're going to be live again from Poudre High School. We're going to start at 530. Uh, we'll be ready to go. We'll put it on YouTube. I would say that now, after you've been here tonight, what a great opportunity, if you haven't already done so, to go to the PSD website, check out all the information on school start times. You saw just a little bit of it tonight. I uh, want to publicly thank Lauren Hooten for her work with that, keeping that stuff going, uh, getting that information disaggregated, brought back together, and, and clarified for all of our families. So I encourage you to go to that site. I encourage you, if you want to hear more, and we'll have different questions probably next Thursday when we're at Pooter, and then we'll go the following week at Fossil Ridge, and then the following week after that, I believe the last one is at Rocky Mountain High School, and I think that one starts at 6, if I'm not mistaken. They have a conflict there that night, so we'll just get a little half-hour start afterward. And Phil, we're going to have this archived on YouTube. Very good. Phil's given the thumbs up. All right, we want to thank everyone for coming tonight. We want to thank our board members, all the people that put the work in. We want to thank you for your time. I know you gave up some family time to come tonight and learn a little bit more about this. Uh, we'll keep you posted, and we thank you again for your participation. Have a great evening.